And it's 8 p.m. here on the East Coast. And as always, we're going to start our call on time. Everyone is now on mute, but when the time comes for questions or comments, I'll tell you how to request unmuting so we can hear you. Uh, my name is Azer Cole. I'm the State Manager for American Promise. And thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for the March 2019 American Promise Association National Call. This is a call that happens on the second Monday of each month. And whether you're here live listening or you're listening to the recording afterwards, you're stepping up to save our democracy, so thank you. Tonight we're joined by guest speaker Scott Graytack, Senior Counsel for Represent Us. And in a second we'll hear from two new American Promise Citizen Empowerment Coordinators, Kimberly Clinch and Rosie Smith. After we hear from Scott, I'll pass it over to John Boyer, leader in the North Virginia American Promise Association who will share about a group's re recent successful outreach meeting. And from there, we'll pivot to the month's action, which is writing letters to the editor, generating support for cross-partisan 28th Amendment Bill, HJR2. Then, Sam Daly Harris, who many of you know, is going to lead a training on generating editorials. And during this section, if you're able to go online and do some research, please be ready to do that, as there will be an interactive component of the call. So it's Women's History Month, and I just wanted to start by sharing a quick story of two powerful female citizen leaders. A leader from the Central Ohio APA was recently driving west for a ski trip with her family, and she stopped at an Airbnb in New Mexico and noticed an American Promise bumper sticker on her host's car. The two quickly realized that they were leaders of their respective APAs, over 1,500 miles away from each other, both fighting for the same thing, a 28th Amendment to the Constitution to restore American democracy in which we the people, not big money, not corporations, not unions, not special interests, govern ourselves. And this is really a huge national project made up of local ones. And American Promise works to serve your local APAs, connecting you with one another, usually virtually through these calls, but sometimes physically through coincidences just like this one. Every day we're making new connections and every day our team is growing. So before I introduce our fantastic guest speaker this evening, I'd like to briefly hand it over to our two new citizen empowerment coordinators, Kimberly and Rosie. So Kimberly, would you mind just taking a minute to quickly introduce yourself to the group along with what got you interested in this cause and then pass it over to Rosie to do the same? Yeah, absolutely. Love to. Uh, am I coming through, Azer? Loud and clear, yes. Awesome. Uh, well, hello, APA members. I am excited to be meeting you all across space and time, and hopefully we'll be bumping into some of you, much the same way our uh, two APA members in that story did. Um, I am originally from Minnesota, or Minnesota, as we say. Um, <laughs> I was politically active from a young age, but it was when I went to college um, that I got really involved in food sustainability and the rights of small farmers. Um, and that was where I got my first concrete experience seeing how uh, big money in the form of Monsanto and the meat lobbies was stopping a lot of common sense legislation that would benefit a lot of average Americans, including many, many small farmers. Um, and you know, went on to see how that same story is repeated time and again, issue after issue. Uh, and so have since come to see big money as something that's really fundamentally threatening our very existence as a democratic republic. So I'm super honored to be joining American Promise and taking on my duty as a citizen of a democracy to fight for that democracy uh, and be working with fellow patriots like all of you um, and also be working shoulder to shoulder in the trenches with my new colleague, Rosie. So I'll pass it over to her to introduce herself. That was awesome, Kimberly. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you, I suppose, over the phone and through space and time, like Kimberly said. I'm psyched to be working with all of you to create a government that works for all of us and not just the corporate elite. I grew up in New York or Long Island, to be more specific. Uh, I graduated last May with a degree in history and political science. And I've had a long, I guess, passion of fighting for the underdog for as long as I can remember. 
I've worked on local, congressional, and presidential campaigns since I was a kid. And last summer, I helped register over 100,000 young people across the country to vote. So I'm really, really excited to bring my passion for citizen empowerment, citizen engagement to this really, really awesome organization. And now I'm going to pass it back to Azer. Great. Thank you, both of you. We're, we're just thrilled to have you on board. And everyone on the call, Kimberly and Rosie, will be just fantastic resources um, for you all as we continue towards winning this constitutional amendment. And I'm now going to introduce our guest speaker, Scott Graytack. He's the senior counsel for Represent Us. And Scott joined the anti-corruption movement because everyone, rich or poor, deserves a fair day in court. He's a native of Cleveland, Ohio. He received his BA and JD from Ohio State University and got his first job out of law school as an Ohio public defender. And I'm just going to quickly cut down on some of this background noise. And as an Ohio public defender, he was representing some of the most vulnerable members of society. Scott now lives in Washington, D.C., where he leads Represent Us's legal and advocacy work while also designing and defending anti-corruption initiatives across the country. He heads up the Legislative Committee of the ACLU in D.C. and is the past president of the American Constitution Society D.C. Lawyer Chapter. So, Scott, before I turn it over to you, let me just quickly give you an idea of the type of people on this call. We're talking to people like Carol Ortenzo, who just led her APA in their first meeting with their member of Congress, Connor Lamb, working to build a relationship and strategize effective ways to work across the aisle. People like Bob Winkleman, who's driving to Pennsylvania's state capitol tomorrow to have 11 meetings with state legislators, showing the importance of state advocacy done in concert with federal advocacy. So that's the type of people on this call. They're doers, and they're doing it. So everyone, as Scott's talking, please be thinking of questions and press 1 on your keypad to raise your hand. So with, with that, Scott, thank you so much for being here, and take it away. You got it. Can you hear me, Azar? Yep. Outstanding. Thanks so much for that kind introduction. And y'all, it's great to be on this call with you and to meet so many of American Promises citizen leaders across the country. Uh, I want to be able to talk about a uh, big convening that Represent Us is putting together later this month in Nashville, Tennessee. I know that a lot of folks on this call are working on local and state level grassroots activism. That's really the DNA for Represent Us as well. Represent Us is a nationwide anti-corruption movement. We're fiercely bipartisan. We work on both sides of the aisle to push our model legislation, which is called the American Anti-Corruption Act. It includes policy changes for getting big money out of politics, for ending abusive practices like partisan gerrymandering, to open up the primary system, and even to change how we vote, uh, support of policies like ranked choice voting and approval voting. So we're bringing together what we hope is the largest convening that has ever taken place in the history of the democracy field later this month in Nashville, Tennessee. Last year, we had a convening in New Orleans that saw 1,500 activists representing all 50 states come together to try and unrig the system. And that's the name of our summit this year as well. The goal behind the summit is to bring folks from all different walks of life, all parts of the political spectrum together to focus on solutions for unrigging our political system. We're going to have over 40 trainings, workshops, panels. We're going to have spark talks, which is a TED style talk from some of the leading experts and advocates in our field. And most importantly, we're going to have a lot of fun. We had comedians and entertainers and bands last year in New Orleans, and we're doing the same thing in, the, in Nashville this year. Obviously, Nashville is a great city to have a good time with a rich music tradition, and we're going to be tapping into that as well. So what I think is most salient for folks who are uh, supporting the movement for 28th Amendment is that we consider this strategy part and parcel of what Represent Us members are doing across the country every day. Um, the 28th Amendment movement is not only the same kind of grassroots, bottom-up strategy that we drive our members to support, uh, but it's the kind of thing that 
that will give us change that lasts. And so when folks come together in Nashville later this month, you'll hear about how uh, the 28th Amendment movement is advancing on a state level and on a federal level uh, through a panel program on the 28th Amendment movement that's going to feature national experts and national elected officials and state elected officials. And there will also be a hands-on workshop that's being led by staff from American Promise that will train up uh, activists and attendees on how they can work to lobby elected officials and to hold them accountable to the commitments that they make to get money out of politics through a constitutional amendment. So I want to save a good amount of time for uh, Q&A in case folks have questions about the summit. But broadly speaking, it's taking place from March 29th through 31st. It's the last weekend of the month. Um, and you can find information about it at www.unrigsummit.org, or you can just Google uh, Unrig the System, and it'll take you to the website. So happy to answer questions you have, and, and thanks so much for hearing a bit about our organization and our conference. Great. Thank you, Thank you Scott, for, for being on this call here with us, for your leadership within Represent Us. You know, truly a fantastic national organization and an organization we're really happy to partner with. Uh, looking forward to the conference and looking forward to hearing from some people on this call right now. These are the people on the ground who have local American Promise Associations and are always trying to figure out ways to best strategize locally and collaborate locally. So please press 1 on your keypad if you have a question. And when I call on you, just shout out your name and where you're calling in from. So I see some hands going up. I'm going to go to Richard Asimus. Richard, where are you calling in from, and what's your question? From Cincinnati. Thanks, Scott, for connecting in here with us. My question is, I know a little bit about Represent Us, but not much. I'm interested in what are the similarities and differences in goals and in your work process and the way you organize. What are the similarities and differences between Represent us and American Promise. Yeah, happy to. That's a, that's a really great question. I think one of the reasons we work so closely with American Promise is because generally we have the same strategy, which is that we know that Congress isn't going to fix the issue of big money in our politics, and so we have to go around them to make change ourselves. So the similarity is that this is a people-driven movement, we work across the aisle, both sides of the aisle, uh, and we believe that grassroots campaigns from the bottom up are the best way to give sustainable long-term change. Um, you know, I would say that our, our specific ability to do that is often through the ballot initiative, and I know that we've partnered with American Promise to explore opportunities where a 28th Amendment strategy and some of our anti-corruption reforms can live together on ballot initiatives and complement each other. Um, I think, you know, broader picture, uh, Represent Us's anti-corruption um, approach is, is trying to really fill in a lot of the holistic parts of, you know, what it takes to run for office, what happens when you're in office, and how to hold folks accountable, um, where we try and take it from soup to nuts, what's still possible, given what the Supreme Court says about money and politics and the First Amendment. We try and take as many innovative ideas that have been uh, tested and had their tires kicked around the country and then build that momentum city to city, state to state, to make the argument that Congress uh, should pass a federal uh, American Anti-Corruption Act. So I'd say no question that the similarities outweigh the differences and you know what makes this such an exciting partnership and we're so proud to have American Promise as one of our members of the Leadership Council for this summit, is that we, are, we both believe in a grassroots, bottom-up, uh, bipartisan strategy to be able to win long-term change. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that was really well articulated, Scott. And I'm going to pass it over to another citizen leader um, over in the conference's neck of the woods. Chet, you're unmuted. Where are you calling in from? And uh, what's your question? Yeah, I'm, I'm calling from Knoxville, and I'm just curious about our status of HJR2. Um, 
I realize it's a, a joint resolution which is required to do an amendment to the Constitution. I, I'm just curious as to where we're at with it. I see there's about 96 or 97 people who've signed on to it, uh, but I only see one Republican at this point. Am, am, am I correct with that? Yeah, great question, Chad. And, and Scott, I'd be happy to, to tackle that one if, if you want, um, or happy to turn it over to you. Yeah. I think you're a little bit closer to that in particular, but I'm happy to chime in afterwards. Probably. Well, well, Chet, you know, that's a great question and, and very relevant to the, the 28th Amendment, HJR 2, was, is a new 28th Amendment proposal recently introduced in the 116th Congress. Um, it has cross-partisan support from its lead co-sponsors, John Katko, a Republican, joined Florida Democrat Ted Deutsch and Massachusetts Democrat Jim McGovern. Um, so the status is it's currently in Congress, and we're going to be really continuing um, to actively advocate to our members of Congress that this is legislation that they should co-sponsor. Um, you know, you have the up-to-date, it sounds like, list of co-sponsors. Um, so HJR 2 will, along with uh, other 28th Amendment bills like HJR 48, continue to be um, key areas of focus for APAs. Um, again, as people have questions, please press one on your keypad. Um, and we've got a really great opportunity to hear insights from one of our major partners um, about their national strategy, about their philosophy of change, um, and maybe even about ways that local groups might be able to coordinate with local represent us groups, um, which certainly seems like a huge potentially um, just addition to any group. And I see that Rosie has her hand up. So Rosie, where are you calling in from and what's your question? Hi, Aether. I'm calling from Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, I just wanted to ask Scott, and thank you again for talking with us tonight. I'm really excited about the Unrig Summit. You mentioned that there's like panels and speakers. Can you talk for a few seconds on some of the people that will be there uh, this year? Absolutely. And, and I want to go back to Chet's question briefly as well, why I can convince him maybe to take that drive from Knoxville. Um, we're going to have an all-star panel talking about the 20th Amendment. I mean, Jeff Clements is going to be introducing a panel that is moderated by the president of the American Constitution Society, Carolyn Fredrickson, a really big name in this field with a ton of experience pushing for successful legislation on Capitol Hill. And then it's going to be a moderated discussion between who you just heard, as you said, one of the sponsors, Representative Ted Deutsch from Florida, and a Republican from New Hampshire, a former state senator named Jim Rubens. And this is designed to give a really great, you know, where are we at in the movement? And how can this be moved forward on a congressional level and also on a state-by-state -state level? Um, there is a lot of opportunity opening up for state-level reforms uh, for, for changes like the 28th Amendment. And so we really want to use that time to bring it to the surface. It's going to be a main stage panel presentation. And then something we're doing at Unrig is, you know, you go to all these conferences and they have sort of the panels where they talk at you and you're mostly just kind of listening. We want to make this much more engaging. So for every panel theme that we have, so whether it's the 28th Amendment movement or uh, money in politics or changing how we vote uh, or voting rights, those are followed up by smaller what we're calling master classes. Uh, and this is one of the things that um, our folks in American Promise are going to be helping out with is they're going to be teaching uh, a workshop on how to not just take you know some of the great communications content and policy content about a 20th Amendment, but how to actually go to elected officials and get them bought into this and to, to persuade them to prioritize the 28th Amendment, and then how to follow up with them and hold them accountable if they make the pledge to support this in order to drive real change. So we want to combine you know, sort of those high level, here's the issue, here are the leading experts in this space with what folks can do now who have shown up on a state and local level, activists who are ready to start moving the ball down the field and give them the tools they need to be able to go home and start putting points on the board. Fantastic. I see some hands really starting to raise now. So let's go to Carol Ortenzo. Carol, you're unmuted. Where are you calling in from and what's your question? 
Uh, hi, Azer. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm calling in from uh, McMurray, Pennsylvania, just south of Pittsburgh. And uh, I, I heard uh, Scott say in his opening remarks that the uh, organization represent us as a very bipartisan group. And I think that many of us are finding that uh, the majority of the people in our areas who are interested in American promise are Democrats. And uh, we are, what, what is your strategy for making your group uh, solidly bipartisan and perhaps uh, as we go forward and speak with more of our officials, and for me, many of them in my area are Republican officials, uh, we can maybe use some of your strategies to uh, help convince them, as you say, to prioritize the 28th Amendment. But uh, how is it that your organization is so bipartisan? That's a that's a really good question. I, I appreciate that. We get we get asked that a lot. You know, I think some of the innovations we bring to this space, which we know has traditionally been championed by progressives uh, and Democrats, going back to uh, the Tillman Act, to Watergate reforms, to you know, of course, the orientation decisions like Citizens United, is that you know we try and use language that gives on ramps to uh, folks outside you know, sort of the, the typical bubble, your typical audiences. So we, we call it corruption because we know that corruption polls as an area of, of concern for, you know, 90% of progressives and 70-some percent of conservatives. Uh, we use highly visible champions of our campaigns that are uh, well-known Republicans. In a, in a state or a city, as well as well-known Democrats. For example, in, in you know, deep red North Dakota this last cycle, um, our chapters supported a statewide constitutional amendment that included the most expansive disclosure law ever passed in the country to get rid of dark money in North Dakota, created an ethics commission, uh, it closed the revolving door between um, elected office and lobbying. It banned lobbyists from being able to give uh, multiple campaign contributions to politicians. It had recusal rules. It was a, a comprehensive anti-corruption act. And we had a Republican chair and a Republican co-chair and a Democrat co-chair. And you know, I, I think you all have probably seen this, uh, you know, maybe, uh, of course, on the Supreme Court level or in the Senate, these these uh, fault lines are so much more clear between the parties. But when you get down to a grassroots level, I mean, you know, the same day that uh, President Trump was elected with 63% of the vote in South Dakota, they approved our Anti-Corruption Act in South Dakota that created a public financing system. I think that's because folks, you know, on a grassroots level care about these issues and, you know, they haven't been brought into power or, or you know, created dependencies on the system that empowered them, uh, that they have such, um, you know, unrelenting sort of unflinching opinions uh, on these issues. So I, I would say that we're really trying to prove that this is something that's possible in red states. And so the way we talk about it, the champions for it, and then the kind of reforms we include, you know, things like lobbying reform, transparency, things that are broadly popular with the public, um, help expand what's outside of a, a more traditional progressive base. Fantastic. Yeah, Carol, I'm glad you asked that question because that's the one that, uh, that we'll get right if we are to win. I and mean, thank you, Scott, for the insight there. Um, just makes a ton of sense. And I'm going to pass it over to another citizen leader Bishwari Solahu. Bishwari, where are you calling from and what's your question? Hi there. I'm uh, calling from Santa Fe. And um, this is, is a total piggyback on what just was talked about. Um, two things. One is, w what state was that, um, Scott, that you just were referring to where they uh, had a... North had Dakota. A, this past North year. North Dakota. Yep. Okay, I'm going to do a little research into that and, and hopefully utilize that. Um, but the other thing, the other question I had is very specific to the uh, summit coming up. I received a, no, a notice about a uh, National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers event that I'm not going to be able to make. But is there a way to 
connect with that group at the conference specifically? Yeah, absolutely. I think the easiest way, if, if through your email, it probably has a registration link, hopefully, to an event that they're doing. Yeah. It's not something that we're putting on directly, but we have events that partner groups, um, you know, partners like American Promise are, we want to be able to cross-pollinate our, our right. movements and be able to build off the fact that we're all there to collaborate. And honestly, that's where some of the best stuff came up in uh, New Orleans this last year. Yeah. New, build a new relationship, taking advantage of the fact that we got so many people in one place. So I'd follow up through that email because it's probably being designed by NANR. Um, yeah. They all have the specifics on it. Um, but I'll tell you what, and, and this goes to anybody on the call, if you want to email me directly, my email is, is just scott, S-C-O-T-T, at represent us, at represent dot us, and uh, I can provide you know, any details to help try and steer you in the right direction to make sure you connect with those folks. And with us, why don't you come say hello to us as well? There's going to be a lot of people, so make some time. Great, Scott. I, I'm sure some people will, will take you up on that right away. Um, I, I see we've got a couple more hands up. We probably have time for two more questions. So I'm going to pass it over to Ellen Greenbush. Ellen, where are you calling in from and what's your question? Hi, this is Ellen. I'm calling from uh, Port Clinton in Northwest Ohio. And uh, we have just connected with a newly formed uh, Represent Us group in this area. And uh, one of the things I was wondering is it, it seems like with American Promise, we have a very specific mission, and that is, you know, to um, to get support for the 28th Amendment. How does your organization or the grassroots groups decide kind of what issues to tackle within their particular state, let's say like in Ohio? So that's an incredibly good question. Uh, I'm also from Ohio. I'm from Medina County, just south of Cleveland. Um, our chapter in central Ohio, for example, um, will have, say, you know, the way typically members get involved with Represent Us is they hear about us online. You know, they get a, a newsletter that we send out, or they see a blog post, or you know, they see something that our social media team did. We just released this video with Jennifer Lawrence and our executive director. Um, and, you know, hopefully from some of the coverage of that, folks kind of get plugged into the big pool. And then from there, they'll reach out and say, you know, say in North Dakota, um, where they have serious corruption issues there. Uh, they'll bring, um, you know, folks from their community together and identify issues that they're concerned about. And then they talk with us and experts in our sort of network of, of national organizations who can give them what are the best practices, what are the model policies, what's worked in other states. Um, you know, we can help advise them on sort of the legally what can you do and how do you design policies and how do you put together a campaign, how do you find champions for that campaign, communications guidance, organizing, you name it. And we sort of work together to be able to, you know, if it's a ballot initiative to be able to write the language and collect the signatures and get it on the ballot. If it's a legislative idea, then, you know, working with legislative sponsors. But, you know, folks on the ground, they always know best what the idea is. We're um, a national organization that tries to support and, you know, encourage um, our members. But at the end of the day, they're going to know in Ohio whether it's transparency reform or cracking down on super PACs or opening up the primaries or whether it's the time to push for 28th Amendment. Um, we really rely on our members to drive those ideas and we're just here to, you know, make sure that they're viable and to try and give them the tools to make it possible. Well, well fantastic. Um, that's all the time we have for questions, but Scott, on behalf of everyone on this call and in the American Promise growing community. Um, just want to thank you for taking the time and, and say we're really looking forward to the conference and, and value the work you guys do and the work you bring to this movement. Um, so thanks and any closing remark that you want to end on, um, now is the time. 
we hope we hope to see as as many American Promise folks as we as possible in Nashville. I mean, it's been such a great partnership between our organizations. We have strategies and goals that are in such close alignment. We hope that if you you, you want to learn more about what's going on in the movement, you want to get the latest tools in order to, to help bring change back to your community, uh, to check out Unrig the System Summit, Nashville, it's the last weekend of this month. And thanks so much for letting me uh, speak and answer some questions with you all. It's, it's been a pleasure to connect with you. And thanks, Edward. Yep, fantastic. We'll see you, see you in just a couple short weeks. And we'll, we'll keep moving on to the second half of this call. And I, I just want to reiterate how excited I am for this year um, and highlight some of what we've accomplished so far already as of last month in 2000, or excuse me, as I mentioned last month in 2017, APAs had 26 media pieces published. And in 2018, we had 106 media pieces published. So far, only three months or so into this year, there's already been 23 media pieces published, almost as many as we had two years ago for the whole year in just a quarter of the time. In 2017, APAs had 17 meetings with elected officials and their staff. And last year, we had 137 meetings. And so far, as of last week in 2019, there's already been 10 meetings with elected officials or their staff and there have been five new American Promise Associations that launched this year just since this past January. So remember, we want to make sure that we know about your meetings with elected officials and your published media pieces so we can include them in our goals next month. And if you've had a meeting with an elected official or their staff or had a media piece published, first of all, congratulations. And second of all, go to AmericanPromise.net, and on the top of your screen, you'll see the Resources tab, and this will take you right to our reporting forms. They'll be at the bottom of the page, and as you scroll down, you'll also scroll right over the American Promise Association Resource Library, um, just a really helpful tool that we've put together for you and your groups to utilize. So now I'm excited to turn it over to John Boyer, member of the North Virginia American Promise Association, to share a little bit about his group's recent successful outreach events. One, they held in partnership with their local League of Women Voters chapters, and another with Jeff Clements and Pulitzer Prize winning author Hedrick Smith. The group's really been harnessing community engagement to drive awareness around the 28th Amendment and increase group membership. So thank you, John, for being here to share, and it is my pleasure to turn it over to you. Thanks, Azor. Yeah, it's been an exciting time for us here. Um, we Each of these events that we pull together just energizes the whole group. You know, we meet new people, we sign on new members. It's a lot of work putting them on, but it's well worth it. And let me just describe some of the ones we've done. Um, as you, as they were just described, on February 23rd, we had a fantastic session. This was at the Scalia Law School at George Mason University, um, where we had it was a it was meant to be an educational event. League of Women Voters wants it to be bipartisan, so we rolled into the session this fantastic uh, Oxford-style debate that Jeff Clements took part in with Floyd Abrams. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you haven't. Bipartisan options to governor address the governing influence of money in politics, but it really lays out on both sides, the arguments on both sides. So it's bipartisan. And then we had a wonderful discussion with um, a Democrat and a Republican. Tom Davis was very prominent in the House of Representatives. Um, he's local here. And then Gene Rossi, who, was, who ran for uh, lieutenant governor here, but he was assistant attorney general. He's a he's an active on the Democratic side. They are friends. They know each other. They had this fantastic discussion about the point substantively, back and forth. And we had a really good crowd, about 50 people. Um, it couldn't have gone better as far as I'm concerned. I mean, in a sense, you realize this is a complicated issue, but the main thing is it's understandable. And, they, and both speakers made that clear they really we need more people aware of what's at stake here what are the issues both really hit the issue of disclosure they just feel like that's important maybe a more reachable goal maybe not that's something they stress but 
it was an excellent discussion. And then just a few days later, on the 28th of February, we had this town hall meeting. It was Money and Politics town hall meeting with Jeff Clements and Hedrick Smith, and that was terrific. Uh, we held it at a local high school. Um, Hedrick, uh, Jeff gave an overview of American Promise, what they're doing, you know, what's happening all across the country. Uh, Hedrick, we rolled in three of Hedrick Smith's videos, which everyone on this call should become familiar with. Um, they're available through the American Promise Association website. Um, they're terrific. He's gone around the country and recorded stories of citizens in various ways addressing uh, money and politics in various ways, dark money and so on. They were very powerful. They're short. They're very accessible. And then we had a really terrific conversation. Um, and I, the one thing that really struck me at, at this was both Jeff and Hedrick got across the idea that this is in our tradition. This is in a historical tradition of citizens working on things to pass amendments, to overturn Supreme Court you know, rulings, or even local initiatives. And both cited examples of things that were introduced that took years to pass. I just thought that was very important. They were both saying, this can be done. It's not easy, but it can be done. And the more you get involved with it and connect with people who want this done, you just connect with them and you gain momentum from that. And it is possible. This is not an easy thing we're involved in. But what it really is at heart is getting people more civically engaged. I mean, that's the bottom line. And I've been very involved with that myself here in Virginia for, for years. So this fits right in with what I'm interested in. Um, what we're planning to do next is we met with Jeff, our members of our key team. He told us about brewing democracy uh, that's taking place in other states. Um, we, by the way, have a one general meeting with all of our members, which is getting larger and larger. Um, two months ago, I guess, we Skyped in uh, Vicki Barnes from Minnesota for the first part of our meeting, who told us about how she organized in Minnesota, went out to the very conservative parts of the state and got them to pass local resolutions. That was very informative. We want to do the same thing, Skype in some of the people who have been doing brewing democracy uh, meetings. We're going to try to do that here in Virginia. We're, we're targeting some redder parts of the state. Here in Northern Virginia, it's pretty blue, but we've already targeted two areas that are outside of our area, but we're talking with people about having these kind of events. And that's coming up this year. And we're very excited about that. I think what I've learned from this is that you can really, it's really important to connect with people, uh, other people in American Promise and other parts of the country who are doing things. We're, we're not, we launched last year, we're finding our way, but along the way, we're realizing others are doing things and that we can be in touch with them and we can learn from them. And I think just on this call tonight, there was a lot of good suggestions by Scott, you know, about how you can reach some of these people who are hard to reach and, and get involved in this. Find the right language. Jeff told us about that, too. So I would just end by saying that uh, I just find we're very excited. We're getting more members. Uh, we're, we're employing Skype tools to reach out to other groups so we can get more of our members directly involved and then get them involved in s some follow-up meetings, brewing democracy, that kind of thing. Uh, oh, and then I completely forgot, we're arranging with local universities to screen and, and have discussions of Hedrick Smith's film about the people versus the politicians. We're fortunate that Hedrick lives right here in Washington, D.C. Um, we work very closely with him, and we're looking forward to that. And there's a whole series of screenings we want to have with college faculty and students to discuss these same issues. So anyway, that's pretty much what we're doing here. We're very excited. And uh, we're looking forward to working with our new members and meeting them, a few of them every week, start coming to our meetings. A lot of them have lots of background and experience. It's just terrific working with them. So pulling these people in and starting to work with them is very exciting. That's what we're doing. Fantastic, John. Your, your energy is contagious. And I love what you're saying about seeing the value of connecting with people in other parts of the country. That is exactly the network that we're trying to build of people all across the country doing this local but related 
work, no, no matter where you are in this country. And I'm now going to turn it over to a boy Gatheru, our outreach manager for American Promise, who certainly knows the value of reaching out to some of those student groups and other organizations in your community um, to talk about this month's action. Hey, well, boy. Hey, Azer, and hi, everybody. Thank you, John, so much for sharing that. It's been such um, so great to see how your group is really infectious with energy and um, moving forward, which is really awesome. Um, so going over this month's action, we're going to be writing letters to the editor about winning the 28th Amendment to get big money out of politics. And again, this is not a partisan issue. It's an American one. And it will require respectful conversations for change. Um, this month, we're specifically going to focus on generating support for HJR2. Now, in the action sheet that was sent today and will also be sent tomorrow in the subsequent follow-up email, the language for HJR2 is included. Um, so definitely take a look at that to see exactly what the language includes. But I know all of you are super tuned into the movement already, so you probably already know. Um, again, so be sure to include a specific event or meeting time and place for folks to, uh, to direct their action when you're writing your letters to the editor. This is a great opportunity to engage with people who may feel as though there's nothing to do until the 2020 election. And it's also a great time to inspire your community to get involved in this cause. Um, I can speak from personal experience that when you actually are able to tie in a specific event uh, to your letter to the editor, the turnout is actually super incredible. Um, the launch that I just had two weeks ago in Portland, Maine, we had a great um, letter to the editor published talking about if you want to get more involved, you know, come out to our launch. And over 60 people showed up. Same thing happened in St. Louis where we were expecting a small crowd of about 20 and about 50 people came, all because of well-timed letters to the editor. So I would definitely encourage you if you're going to have an event sometime soon, um, time your letter to the editor, you know, a week or two out so that you can tell people about it. And it's a really great way to get some free publicity. Um, so going back to the letter itself, some newspapers require that letters to the editor must be responding to a previously published article or an editorial. So in this case, look for an article re recently published by a publication that relates to the issue of money and politics in an election. Find an article that allows you to easily tie the issue of money in politics and be sure to express how attending your group's meeting is a great way to combat that problem. So going back to that example that I brought up about um, in St. Louis where we had one of the APA leaders there write a letter to the editor and it was actually at the perfect time um, one because it was right before the launch and two it was right when the Brett Kavanaugh fiasco was happening and people were realizing the importance of the Supreme Court and this leader made a really smart pivot to say that you know the Supreme Court is made up of fallible humans but the way that Americans have been able to um, correct the wrongs of the Supreme Court is through constitutional amendments and was able to talk about it that way. So that's a really great example. And there's been a lot of coverage about HJR1. I see no reason why HJR2 wouldn't be a great way to pivot in a letter to the editor. Okay, finally, once you submit your letter to the editor and it's published, make sure you let us know by filling out the citizen reporting form. So go to connect.americanpromise.net and on the Action Center drop down menu, you'll see the Citizen Uprising Action Reporting Form. Fill out the proper form and let us know about your published letter to the editor so we can include it in next month's total. Um, so that's really, really important because again, we share those at the beginning of every call and it's also really great to just see how far we've come. Okay, so now I'm going to pass it over to Sam Daly Harris, who is the author of Reclaiming Our Democracy and the founder of Send It Courage. As always, it's such a special treat when Sam joins us, and he is going to lead us through a training around ways to engage um, effectively with our editorial boards. Hi, Sam. Hi there. Can you hear me? We can hear yes. you. Okay, great. Thank you, Waboy. Hi, everyone. If you need to do anything to put yourself in a position to do some online research, please do that now because I'm going to ask you, to do some online research in a moment. 
We only have 15 minutes, and I'd like to get a role play in, so let's get started. We're going to focus on reaching out to an editorial writer and encourage the newspaper to write an editorial supporting HJ Res 2. Now, of course, we do want the editorial, but our top priority is building a relationship. They may say no to the first time you ask. They may ask you to write an op-ed instead. But if you're on the road to building a trusted relationship with the editorial writer, eventually an editorial and many more will come. So building the relationship is key. Who can briefly tell us the difference between a letter to the editor, an op-ed, and an editorial? Press 1 on your keypad, and Azer will call on you. Who can briefly tell us the difference, briefly, between a letter to the editor, an op-ed, and an editorial? Azer, do we have a volunteer? No, Give not yet, although I feel it's just a second away. All right, we have someone who's raised their okay. hand. Please give your name and city and go ahead. All right, Joan DeVore, thank you for calling in. Where are you calling in from? And thanks for answering this question. Okay, well, this, this is Joan DeVore calling from South Jersey, uh, Tri-County APA, and I hope I get this right. <laughs> uh, letter to the editor is generally a shorter um, composition than an op-ed, um, so, um, it, usually the papers will maybe say a hundred, 250 words for a letter to the editor. Um, an op-ed can be several paragraphs long, um, and go into more depth about an issue. Now the editorial, I think has to be written by someone on the, um, staff of the publication, whereas the letter to the editor and op is someone from the outside, and I guess an op-ed could go either way. Okay, great. Very good. Thanks. So, yes, so the letter to the editor is usually shorter, and by you or maybe someone else, the op-ed is usually longer, and again, it could be by you or somebody else. The editorial is by the newspaper. Technically, it's by the editorial board, but it is the opinion and position of the newspaper. So it's a big fish, and it's one we'd like to catch. If you're looking at a small paper or a weekly paper, they might not even publish editorials. So we're probably looking at the largest newspaper in your area. So here comes the online research. To find out the names of the members of the editorial board, I, I want you to Google this if you can, the name of the newspaper, and then the phrase editorial board. If you can, go online right now and Google the name of the largest newspaper near you and the phrase editorial board. For example, someone might Google the Miami Herald editorial board and then let us know what you find. And please press 1 on your keypad if you found the listing of the editorial board from, the, I guess, the largest newspaper near you. And, Azer, would you interrupt me? And I'm going to show what I found, and let's see if someone else found something. I looked up the Philadelphia Inquirer editorial board and found 12 names, including the cartoonist, the editorial board secretary. I also Googled this Columbus Dispatch and found four names, including the cartoonist, and the copy editor. So not everyone on the list writes editorials. So the cartoonist probably doesn't. The secretary probably doesn't. But they might be able to help you. So, Azer, do you have any volunteers of someone who's Googled the name of their paper and the phrase editorial board and found the list of the two of them or the eight of them or the three of them or whatever it is? Yes, I do. Laura Nittmeyer has raised her hand, and Laura, you are unmuted. Laura, where okay, are you calling uh, from, and what paper did you look up? I'm calling from California, and I, I uh, Googled the uh, the San Francisco Chronicle. And what did board. you find? Um, I found four names. Um, one is just a, actually, I 
four names and four pictures. Uh, one person doesn't have uh, an assignment. Two yep. are are saying um, there's an editorial page editor, there's a, yes. a deputy editorial page editor, and then an editorial writer, and then the fourth person. Okay, so I, it would seem to me that the editorial page editor, the deputy editor, and the writer are all people who write uh, editorials. The fourth we don't know. Are there paragraphs about who they are or what issues they ta uh, they uh, cover, or not right there? Um, let's see if I try click, to click people. <laughs> Because it's going to lead more. right to my next thing. I'm going to just read it. And after you've found the names, and Laura, you have actual names for the editorial writer mm -hmm. or the editorial page editor? Mm -hmm. yeah. You have names there? Okay, I think I lost her. After you find the names of the editorial writers, you then want to do some research to find out which editorial writer writes the editorials on money and politics or campaign finance laws. Mm -hmm. See if there's a bio that says what issues they cover for the editorial page. See if they write a column for the newspaper that would let you know what their beat is. You might call the editorial board secretary, if they have one, or the newspaper's switchboard, or one of the editorials and ask who would cover the issue. Now, we're not going to do that research right now, so we have time for the role play, but you'll want to find the name of the person who writes the editorials on our issue. Now, a lot of you might remember the Ellie Sparks story from Citizens Climate Lobby in the reading during the new group training, and Ellie, not in this reading, but later she said she remembered that her babysitter's father wrote for the Richmond Times-Dispatch, her paper, and she was able to get the babysitter's father to introduce her to the editorial page editor. Do you know someone else at the newspaper? Be creative. Relationships matter. So now the role play. You want to ask a question early in your conversation to which their answer is, no, I'm not familiar with that, and then you can say, can I tell you about it briefly? So I'd like everyone to write down this phrase or these sentences now. So write this down. My name is, and then write your name, and I, leave, and I live here in, and write where you live, and I work on issues around getting money out of politics. Are you familiar with House Joint Resolution 2? Well, I'll say that again in a moment they will probably say no. And then you'll say, can I tell you about it briefly? And then you tell them a little bit about the resolution and why it's important. So before I ask for a volunteer, and I'll go over that phrase again that I'd like you to write down, I want to let you know that the team has prepared an editorial writer packet for you. You'll get it with the recap of this call. So if the editorial writer says, can you send me something? You will have something to send them. You'd also like them to invite you to come down to the newspaper to talk, if they will, because you want to build this relationship. Now, I want to volunteer, someone who's written this down, and here's the phrase again, my name is, and you fill in your name, and I live here in, and you write in where you live, and I work on issues around getting money out of politics. Are you familiar with House Joint Resolution 2? So I'll and, and they're going to probably say no. I mean, it'll be I'll be shocked. I'll play the role of the editorial writer and I'm going to ask someone to press 1 on the keypad if you've written that down. My name is what's your name and I live here in wherever you live and I work on issues around getting money out of politics. Do you, uh, um and sorry, and the, uh, are you familiar with House Joint Resolution 2? And then you be quiet while you hear whether they're familiar with it. I'll be really shocked if they are. So, Azer, do we have a volunteer who would like to call me, their editorial writer, and role play a call? 
Or do you we have do too not, many volunteers? We do not have one yet. Um, although That's I not too many. That, uh, not too many yet. Okay, let's let's go with silence for a moment. My name is, and then you write your name in, I live here in wherever you live, and I work on issues around getting money out of politics. Are you familiar with House yes. Joint Resolution 2? And then and they'll we answer. And have a volunteer, Sam. Uh, yes. I'm going to unmute Ted Kanapke. Ted, thank you. And sorry, Ted, where are you calling from? Uh, Columbus, Ohio, actually. Oh, uh, great. And so your newspaper would be? The Dispatch, the one you mentioned. Yes, the Columbus Dispatch. And then you'll find out one way or another which writer on the paper editorial board writes about this issue. Uh, and uh, and then you'll make the call. So I'm going to be sitting. Do you, did you look it up and find that they even gave you the phone number for the different editorial writers? Uh, I wasn't able to get to it on the uh, website, but I do have it already. In fact, I've already... Oh, okay, great. I'm looking at the names myself, and uh, they do give the phone numbers and the emails. Okay, ring, ring, ring. Oh, uh, hold on, let's look. I'm going to be one of them, and I'm going to be uh, one of the editorial writers, Nate Beeler. And so uh, you just called me up. Ring, 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 ring. Hello, Nate here. Who's calling? Hello, Nate. Uh, my name is Ted Kanapke. I live in uh, Columbus, uh, Worthington area, and my interest is in uh, campaign finance, getting uh, uh, undue money out of uh, campaign finance. Oh, okay. So uh, how would you get my number? Uh, well, I'm a subscriber, and I uh, just went onto the website, and I uh, called a couple people, and it led me to... Uh, to your office, and I was just curious uh, whether you've well, heard much about HJR2. Let me just interrupt for a second. I'm on a deadline, and we have to get our editorials in by 3 o'clock. Is there any possibility you could call me back at like 3.15? Certainly, certainly. Okay, yeah, ring, 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 yeah. ring, ring, ring. Nate here, hello. Hello, Nate. Oh, it's 3.15 now. Yes, I'm following up on our earlier call. You had a deadline, and asked me to wait and I'm Oh sure. Yeah. What's your name again? Ted Knapp. Okay, great. What was your question? Well I'm interested in uh, the dispatch has done a number of letters of the editor and opinion pieces on issues related to campaign finance, getting money out of politics that are causing a lot of uh, uh, unfavorable decisions for the average um, Ohio person, the average American for that matter. I was curious uh, how much awareness you had of the new bill uh, House Joint Resolution 2. Well, let me think. I know H.R. 1. Is it the same one? There's H.R. 1 in a house that passed recently? There is a, a connection, yes. H.R. 1 is three prongs. This specifically, H.R. 2 deals specifically with campaign finance. And can you tell me a little bit about it? Because I know H.R. 1, but I don't know much about H.J. Res 2. Well, the basic idea is to overturn some of the impact or all the impact of the citizenship United decision. Uh, and it said corporations are people and that money is speech. Both of those have led to some 80% um, of uh, Americans or voters, according to several polls, including the Wall Street Journal, have said people are fed up with the impact of money on politics. It's giving too much power to corporations, unions, and very wealthy Americans and we need to do something on both of those aspects out of Citizens United. Okay, great. So let's stop for a moment in the name of time. Any thoughts about what you were just doing? I mean, is it like terrifying or that could be fun or something you might do? You only want one person in the APA in Columbus or one person in the Tri-County, New Jersey APA calling one paper. You don't want an editorial writer to get a call from three different people at three different times. What are your thoughts about what you just did and the whole notion that you could develop a relationship with an editorial writer at the Columbus Dispatch and have them really uh, speaking up for, for example, H.J. Res 2? Any thoughts on what you did and this whole notion? I think it's new to American Promise and APAs. Any quick thing before we turn it back over to Acer? 
Well, I, I think you have to come across as somewhat knowledgeable about the issue uh, that is a bipartisan issue and that you're uh, politely asking for uh, where they are on the issue so that you can start a, a relationship, a conversation. Okay. Bravo. Yeah. And so you'll get materials to give them. Azer and the team will send something around, I think, tomorrow. And, yeah, and you want to build a relationship. Hopefully they'll invite you down to come talk at the newspaper. Uh, thank you, Ted. I'm going to hand it back over to Azer. And thanks to everyone. Uh, this is uh, exciting, terrifying, and makes a big difference. Fantastic. Thank you, Sam. Always, always just fantastic to have you. And as always, we'll end on time. It's 9 p.m. here on the East Coast. So stay afterwards with your group, complete the action sheet, and you know, follow up with some editorial boards, get some editorials generated. That is a fantastic way to deepen your relationship with your local media. Um, so I'm going to take everyone off mute here just to say goodbye and good night. Um, and just thrilled to be doing this work with you all as always. So have a great night, everyone. <laughs>